uh, a young art legend already, uh, amazing legend in the art world, um, was often called the boy king of the art world, still looks like the boy king of the art world, <laughs> and uh, an amazing trajectory of an artist, uh, amazing amount of work, amazing amount of perfection and interest tied in with an interesting life. Um, not that it matters, because this isn't about economics, it's about art, but just at the 2014 Whitney, only had Jeff's work in the entire museum, and not that he got it, but the valuation was about a half a billion dollars of art of Jeff's. Now, that is not the final testament in 500 years, but it's a pretty good signal that the world appreciates what he's done. So I'm going to just give you a very brief, a little bit history in a minute, and then we're going to go into a Q&A, because I find his history so interesting in that a lot of artists are born in the ghetto, are born in very difficult surroundings, and Jeff's father was a furniture uh, entrepreneur, decorator. Jeff spent his life in that world. His mother was a seamstress. He lived the, I like to say, because I was involved with Happy Days and Father Knows Best and uh, you know uh, those kinds of shows. At least as I've read, he'll tell us that he was beaten and all the stuff that made him an artist. But from what I've read, you came from a middle class background, uh, happy family and all that. And through that relationship with your father, that relationship with your father's uh, uh, obsession with his Christmas tree, uh, riding in your grandfather's carriages. See, I've done my homework. Uh, out of that came this evolution of perfection and interest. So I think I'll start just kind of talking about why um, the media, and do you think, like Julian Schnabel and Warhol, that the, the beginning in that era, and you followed beyond that, took it, the, it became, you became like a music star, like a movie star, like the interest in your relationship with the public and your relationship with your art was kind of historic, following, in a way, uh, you know, uh, Rauschenberg to Johns to Warhol, and then you took it to the right to the moon. Were you aware that was going on when you started that? Uh, you know, Michael, I got involved with the art because I always just wanted to participate. <clears throat> I loved the idea of the avant garde and, uh, you know, to be part of something, to be part of a group and to share ideas and. Uh, to make life exciting, you know, for yourself, like to have different sensations and feelings, and to uh, then, you know, hopefully uh, be able to contribute to the group that we all could help each other have greater uh, feelings and greater intellect. So, uh, you know, the idea about uh, uh, celebrity in the art world, nobody ever thought about that. I mean, it was really kind of the last thing you would think about. I would think about trying to be at the service of my work. I wanted to have a platform for my work. Uh, I wanted to have my work, you know, be able to uh, participate in the world. But uh, it was about the sensations. You know, I wanted to have those feelings, and I wanted to become. Uh, I love how art is this, you know, daily exercise that lets you continue to become as a creator and as a viewer and uh, just as an, an appreciator of uh, life. Yeah, but you went to move backwards. I just read in the New York Times that you've donated to Paris after the 2015 terrorist attack a 30-ton, 45-foot piece of work. So that is not, that's gigantic. How, how, did, how did that, because I'm, I'm, I'm really going to go backwards a little bit because that's what just happened is this giant 
30-ton master bouquet, I guess. Bouquet of tulips. Bouquet of tulips is in the process of being donated to the French. Is that going to happen? Because what I read is the street couldn't even hold it. It wasn't, st it wasn't strong enough for a Jeff Koons. Yeah. Uh, you know, Michael, uh, Ambassador Jane Hartley uh, contacted me, and this was probably about a year ago. And, uh, you know, she said, Jeff, I have this idea. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful that between American people and French, that directly that uh, we'd be able to do something, to communicate something, and we could give a gift to the French people, not government to government, but people to people. And she said, would you like to do something in France? You know, maybe you could do a mural or you could do something. And I told Jane, Jane, can, can I just send you something within three hours? Because I already had designed something a couple years ago where I, I shot a photograph and I realized this was a little bit like uh, Bertholdi's uh, hand of the Statue of Liberty, but it was a hand holding a, a, a tulips, balloon tulips. And I thought, you know, this would be wonderful because uh, to create something that would be, uh, you know, honoring the, uh, uh, the dead and uh, the, the victims and uh, the families from the terrorist attacks, that it would be able to be an offering of, of support and compassion and uh, shared ideal, ideals and uh, uh, freedom, at, but at the same time to communicate loss and to perform in a very contemporary way, but at the same time quite archaic, that it would be a universal symbol of loss, but at the same time uh, an optimism that we have to put our best foot forward for the future. So I, I designed this. It's a, it's, a, it's a hand coming like this, offering with a bouquet of balloon tulips and kind of pastel colors, light blue, yellow, white, pink, but they're only 11. So uh, internationally, people deal with sets of 12, like a dozen. So uh, everybody uh, can feel that, if you look closely, that sense of loss, that uh, it'll never be 12. Uh, the victims of the attacks will never be back. That loss to the families can never uh, uh, not occurred. But uh, so it's, it's always uh, uh, honoring that loss, but at the same time, uh, an optimism to move forward for uh, our children and uh, future generations. And how are the uh, French reacting? I read most of them think it's fantastic, and then they're the usual group that don't understand it, think it's big. It's not as big as the uh, Statue of Liberty, so not so big. Um, <laughs> are they giving you a lot of trouble that it's too heavy? That yeah. Or that you go through with every piece of sculpture? You know, I have to say, the French have been amazing to me. They've been so supportive. I mean, I, I've had exhibitions at Versailles. I was a, the first living artist to, uh, to have a major exhibition there. I'm an officier in, their, uh, uh, in the, the Légionnaire. So, I mean, the French have showed at the Pompidou, a retrospective. They've been extremely supportive. Uh, but in anything, there are different dialogues. I think that a, a lot of people really enjoy uh, the piece. Uh, the location that was uh, chosen for it, once the location was chosen, I think that people, you know, started to realize this is, uh, you know, really a beautiful uh, space. And I think that the tulips, bouquet of tulips, would be perfect for there. And, uh, you know, I'm confident it'll happen as far as that location. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, you know, then uh, they oh. would speak about a new location. But at, the, at this moment, we're still uh, believe that that's where it will be. I'm sure it's going to happen. And that's on the Plaza de Tokyo. It's in front of the uh, Museum of uh, Modern Arts of the uh, city of uh, Paris and the Palais de Tokyo. Look, when we did, and your work is serious and Disney is more frivolous, but we did uh, Disneyland Paris. Mitterrand says, Mickey is not my thing. He's not my cup of tea. <laughs> Fabius, who was the prime minister, uh, turned his back on us. However, the day before we opened, they each asked for about 20 tickets and could they have t-shirts? <laughs> so I think there's, there's two sides to even the most left uh, in the French. So now to go back. So you had this on the outside, would look like a really comfortable childhood. Um, how, how did you go from Leave it to Beaver 
to, um, with all these angelic pictures of you playing with crayons, to being an artist and on the way going through the difficulties of getting galleries to recognize you and people to accept you and some failure and then unbelievable success. But in the beginning, before you went to college, did you even have any idea this is what you were going to do? Uh, well, when I was three, my parents uh, let me know when I was making a drawing that they thought it was really special. And it was the first time that- We all think that about our children, well, <laughs> by the way. And, and, and I, absolutely, I try to be very supportive. I think family is so important uh, to uh, you know, the future that we give to, uh, to people. I mean, how we're able to give support to individuals. Uh, it's, it's the most wonderful thing you can do in life. And I think the most rewarding is to try to inform. I try to with my art. I always, because uh, it's taken me, it lets me become, and each piece is taking me to a certain place. And to the best of my ability, within the contextual way that I see that work, I try to inform the viewer. The viewer is going to bring their own history. They're going to bring their own interest to it. And they're going to finish their personal narrative to the piece. But uh, you know, art is an amazing uh, vehicle to educate and to inform. When you were five, were you a perfectionist? Were you technologically interested? Were you like everything had to be in its right place, and if it wasn't perfect, you'd have a tantrum? Uh, my father was. And um, you know, so my father had a furniture store, and he taught me aesthetics. And he taught me that if you have a vision, that you're able to ex uh, execute it. But you need a vision. So when he would design somebody's living room, he would have graph paper and he'd lay everything out. He knew exactly what size chair should be there and he'd never deliver a lamp that would be too small, it would be the correct size. And so my dad taught me that about vision and also that colors and textures and all of these things affect your feelings. So I was susceptible to that, but I had no idea what art was. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania uh, middle class background, I would say lower middle class, but middle class, my family always let me feel a sense of social mobility. We would go on, they would take us, my sister and I, on wonderful trips. So they, uh, they kept us engaged in life and invigorated and always experiencing interesting uh, uh, things. So uh, to the best of their ability, but I, and I was always in art school, uh, in high school. I took private lessons also from the age of seven to about 13. So your parents recognized that you had talent? They, they recognized that, yes. I could draw things, and I uh, could make uh, you know, a glass look like a glass, and I give things perspective. And you know, I would win uh, awards for these type of things, even locally. But when it came time to graduate high school, the only thing I was really prepared for was art school. Um, I could have gone to a liberal arts college, but you know, I had I didn't know anything about mathematics. I had no desire for that. Or, so I ended up going to art school. And I went to uh, uh, a school that uh, you know, informed me about art history. The first day I had my first art history lesson, it really changed my life. Because I realized You knew nothing about artists or art history until you went to Baltimore and then Chicago. That Brought it out in you? My parents bought me a Dali uh, a book, you know, a book with the uh, persistence of memory on the cover. I had that coffee table book. I would have known Picasso and Dali. But uh, my first day uh, of school, I went to the Baltimore Museum of Art. Uh, they had a our whole class went there. And I realized I didn't know Brock, I didn't know Cezanne, I didn't know Matisse. And I feel that most people don't survive that moment. And I have always, within my art, have, they don't. And, and, and you know, most people don't survive art school either. They'll give you the different numbers of how many uh, you know, students, children start art school, how many graduate, then how many go on uh, into exhibiting and all of these things. And what uh, pulls people down is their lack of acceptance of themselves and the lack of acceptance of their own cultural history and who they are. Everything is always about this moment forward. And uh, I survived that moment. And I've always have tried to create an art that communicates to the viewer that they are perfect. Everything about them is perfect. And it's, it's, a, it's about this moment forward. 
and it's about you, what you bring to the work. When people use art, and that empowers people, that's empowerment. But if you, you use art the other way, it disempowers people. It creates all the rules and all the hierarchy, and you should know this about this artist, and you should know that, and uh, uh, that's disempowerment. But when you were there, were you there thinking you were going to be a working artist, or were you there thinking you were going to be an art historian or a curator? Did you know? And, and, and were you watching what was happening in New York with the Rauschenbergs and the Julian Schnabels and, and whatnot, or were you looking for girlfriends? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was probably doing both. <laughs> uh, you know, art school is a very liberal experience, so I was participating in, in kind of a, a, a lot of different things. But uh, I realized. There's a lot to go into that. But okay. What, what happened? Uh, for me, uh, Michael, when I had my first art history lesson, my teacher's name, Bo Davis, he put a Manet slide on the screen and started talking about Olympia. And in that painting, what different uh, images, part of the painting could have meant, like the black cat over in the uh, far left corner, the far right corner of the painting, in 19th century France, what that could have meant, the bouquet of flowers being offered to the woman, uh, the position of the woman in reference to like uh, a Goya's a woman. And all of a sudden, you know, my life just opened up. I felt like, you know, the luckiest person because I realized that I could really be a dilettante. I could be involved with philosophy and sociology and psychology and aesthetics and uh, physics, and that art lets you involve with all the human disciplines. Do they you... teach those things at art school? Oh, well, you know, I mean, you do. You know. Electives that you could take history sure. courses? And... Yes, but it just opens up life to you to self-educate. But of course, in, in the school I went to, I could study philosophy and history and these things. But, uh, but that's how art functions every day of our lives, that it lets us be involved in all these dialogues. It's, a, you know, it's about our interests, and it's about uh, uh, the, the creator's interests, it's about the viewer's interests, and it's about your own potential. When you look at something, and you could say, oh, this is a fantastic Van Gogh. Look at that, it's amazing. And we all can say about you know, how great it is, but its art is in the essence that it uh, gives you of your own self-potential. Are you thinking art. that at 19 years old? Are you thinking that now, looking back at when you were 19 years old or 20 years old? I'm thinking that now, but at 19, I was feeling that. Uh, I think when you're younger, you're more involved in feelings. Feelings become ideas. But, uh, but that's, that's how art functions. What is of value in an artwork is what it can do for you. And what it does for you is let you reach your potential. That's its value. It's not about, doesn't that represent a tree so wonderfully and it's so lush and isn't it beautiful? The beauty is our humanism and what we can become. It's interesting because I have a lot of friends, son, friends of my son that go to film school. And when they graduate, they've made these, uh, I recommended this for my son not to do it, but every one of their student films is unbelievably serious. And it's unbelievably about flowers opening and sunspots and sexuality. And then they get a diploma, and they have nothing to do, and they've got to go get a job. And it's kind of an awakening of the academic world of introspection to the real world of having to do your own laundry. So you now graduate from Chicago, and you are now, as I understand it, at MoMA, not as a curator, but downstairs with red hair and looking rather avant-garde, selling memberships to the museum. And from what I understand, you were really good at that. You were very theatrical and sold more memberships than three other people. Is that right? And were you trying to do art at the same time you were selling memberships? Uh, you know, it, it, it's correct. I doubled the membership, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so you're always, deep down, not a bad businessman. Well, I don't know. It's, for me, it's not about business. But when I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I was nine years old to uh, 12 years old, even maybe eight on, you know, I would go door to door. 
And I started, I took guitar lessons and they had uh, a, a certain charity they were doing something for and they wanted us to sell some mint chocolates to raise money for this charity. And I went out and did it and I loved it. And, uh, and so I started, I would sell gift wrapping paper, I would sell bows, chocolates. And after school, my mother would take me to a neighborhood, a suburban neighborhood, and wait in a car, and I would go door to door from one house to another. You're the perfect intern. But, but perfect. I, I loved it. How I loved do we it. find more of you around? No, no, no. <laughs> but I really loved it because, you know, you never knew who was going to open that door. You knock on the door, and you never knew what they were going to look like. You never knew if they opened the door what odor was going to come out of the home. <laughs> You never knew if they invited you into their home, if they were going to have plastic on their furniture. What you weren't nervous about doing this? Most people, like, have to go door to door, like, sweating. No, no, They'd I like kill it. me. It was, it was, for me, it was uh, communication, and it was acceptance. And what I try to do with my work today, this, uh, this acceptance of self-acceptance of who I am, and I think that where art can take you, subjective art, you learn how, I mean, everything goes full circle to objective art, but you learn how to trust in yourself. And then when you trust in yourself, automatically you want to go outside the self. And that takes you to the acceptance of other people, where you accept them. And everything's metaphor for that. When you're working with images or objects, it's all metaphor for self-acceptance and the acceptance of others. I'm that, just trying to you accept survive. Survive. I'm just looking at you survive. You're, you're starting to be an artist, yeah. and you're selling so, uh, so I, when I moved to New York, I, I worked uh, in Chicago at the Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art as an art preparator. I wanted what? an art preparator to uh -huh. hang art inside a museum to move hammer the it. art. Yeah, yeah, okay. hammer it. And so I did that as a, a college job. And when I moved to New York, uh, after finishing art school, uh, I applied at the Museum of Modern Art to be a preparator. And I would call them every day, and they wouldn't have a job, but I could contact them every day, finally. Uh, the, the personnel department said, look, Jeff, uh, if you'd like to work here, we can put you in the ticket booth. And you can uh, sell tickets. It's not a preparator, but if you'd really like a job. And I told him I would take it. And I realized when I was there that I didn't want to get bored. And during my break, they had put me behind the information desk where they sold memberships. And I realized nobody was really trying to sell memberships. They were just processing them. And that there were really great things that if you would upgrade your membership, you would get free books. And I mean, really, it was. But but it was the to the advantage of the person. They would actually do really well to upgrade. So I started to communicate. <laughs> I started to communicate that to people. So I did. I, I doubled the membership at the Modern. So people would start to. They would come in and they'd ask me if I wanted to work for them, and I ended up selling mutual funds. And uh, well, no, you went to, seriously to a financial institution, selling mutual funds. That's right. I got licensed and registered, making money money. so you could support your art, or just because you like selling mutual to, funds to support my art, to support my art. So at and night, were you doing art, or during oh, the weekend? Oh, at night and the weekends, and I was always an artist. But instead of you know laying drywall or painting, you know I was I was doing this. I was selling mutual funds, and eventually I get uh, registered. That gratifying. People like, buy it, and you think, wow. You know, I was so happy when I was able just to make uh, my living and support my art through my art. Uh, you know, it was a way that I was able to make enough income to make my triple deckers to make my aqua lung, my bronzes, my equilibrium show. But I gave it everything. And a couple times I went broke because I made those vacuum cleaners and nobody wanted those vacuum cleaners. That was, that, and, uh, wasn't that a, kind of a, a milestone, the vacuum cleaners, in your evolution as an artist that you, they weren't just vacuum cleaners, but they had uh, some sexuality. They were male and female and stacked on top of each other. And, you know, they weren't just images. They, they had, at least to you and to people that finally have looked at them years later, they had a lot of texture, uh, obviously the perfection that you're known for, the technology you're known for, but also content. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, I mean, you were funding. It's not cheap when you're just selling uh, institutional financial opera things to then go out and buy these expensive vacuum cleaners. I mean, not a lot of people have 20 vacuum cleaners. 
know, I, I, and, and that's why I had to make the income some way. <laughs> but, but the other thing that I did, uh, Michael, when I made my equilibrium show, and my equilibrium shows where I have basketballs just hover like in a fish tank, a one ball tank, just I, mean, I, I have to interrupt you. I still look at those basketballs inside that, how does that work? That's a magic trick that's amazing. Well, it, it, it is, it's quite simple. But I wrote people like, this is an uh, aquarium, and it looks like it's filled completely with water. Mm -hmm. And if you put a basketball, it would float on the top. But these basketballs do not float on the top. They're in the middle. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's a density gradient. But I ended up working with uh, <laughs> it's, Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, That's too easy. Uh, uh, How do you, your technology later is unbelievable. And we'll get to the Plato and some of the other stuff. But this is early on. And you're not a physicist, you're not an engineer. You just went out and found somebody that told you how, about density and water. I mean, I, also, I, I started to realize that I wanted to make uh, equilibrium pieces. And I was reading a lot of Kierkegaard and Satra. And so I was pulled in this uh, direction to make that work. And uh, I, I saw uh, basketballs. I, I made my vacuum cleaner pieces. And I wanted to get away from that image. I wanted to make something more biological. Uh, something that was uh, pre-birth. And uh, so to me, the, uh, the tanks are very, very metaphysical. They're pre-birth, they're after death, they're, they're, uh, they really are metaphysical. But uh, so I saw in the Time Magazine, uh, uh, Dr. Richard P. Feynman enjoyed art. So I called up Feynman. And I told Feynman that, uh, you know, I was working on trying to make uh, these tanks that would be permanent equilibrium. But I wanted to do it within an aquarium. And he told me I could do it. But, uh, and, I, and I could do it probably if, uh, if I would give up all the different aesthetic purity that I wanted to create. But, uh, but within these confines, I couldn't. The most, uh, uh, the liquid with the greatest uh, uh, density gradient would be like a silicon oil, and I'd still need a much, much bigger tank than uh, the aquarium. But I ended up making it that it wasn't permanent. They last a maximum in the most ideal conditions, about six months uh, maximum but they have this purity about them. And uh, so that's, that's why I made that uh, work. So when you did Equilibrium, and you did the basketballs, and you did the vacuum cleaners and the other things you did. Michael, can I just cut in here one Yes, Because I wanted to finish one thing. Um, when I made that work, I made pieces that I sold at a loss. So my Aqualung, I sold for $3,000. It cost me $19,000 to make it. My lifeboat, uh, it cost me twenty. dollars I think I sold the lifeboat at ten or nine. But what was important to me was to have a platform for my work. I never was interested in the money, in a way. I mean, I always felt that I could take care of myself, whether pumping gas or whatever I had to do. But I wanted to participate. And if I was going to have the opportunity to participate, now was the time. And so I would just, I would go for it. You actually are answering the question that I was just about to ask, which is when they weren't selling for as much as you were investing in them, and you were working during the day to get the money to invest in things that were selling for less, for a very short amount of time, I don't know if you gave up, but you went to Florida where your parents had retired, and thought, this is not working. And then shortly thereafter, you came back to New York. What motivated you to go? And what motivated you to come back and say, oh, no, I, this is still going to work? What motivated me to go was I was broke. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I went there, and I raised enough money to come back and get an apartment and start over. And actually, when I come back, I had to do that twice. But uh, the last time that when I came back, then I did my equilibrium show. and. Uh, so it was always uh, to do it. And you know, a lot of people, though, you know, if you would leave New York, I remember going home the first time and telling my mom and dad, you know, it's over for me. You know? uh, once you leave New York, mom, dad, you don't understand. You're ostracized. You know, the, the, my, my friends, nobody's ever going to accept me back there. I'm done. You know, I'm fried. Oh, my gosh. But you, know, but you go back and you do it. Uh, and you can do it. If you, if you, I always just wanted to participate. And I think you came did. back, and then you exploded. You had, and I'm interested in the whole evolution of Michael Jackson, and Rabbit, and those early, you know, ex ex extraordinary works. 
particularly Michael Jackson, because you, uh, I worked with him, uh, so I may have a different vision of him than you do. You think he's more Christ-like? I think, you, I think I've read it. You think he's more Christ-like? I think he's more like a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but what is it about his image and his position in media that, be, that you became obsessed with? That's a major work, and people talk about that work all the time. When I made my banality show, and, uh, and I showed banality in 88, I really wanted to communicate what we were speaking about earlier. I wanted to be as precise as possible to let the viewer know that whatever they respond to, it's perfect. They're perfect. Uh, if, if they like pink for pink, pink is beautiful. You know, If you like uh, blue, if you like uh, a rough material, if you like porcelain, it's good. If you find porcelain sexual, you know, if it makes you, uh, you know, think of a bathroom, whatever it is, it's great. Or if you like wood, because wood thinks makes you feel more spiritual. But it, it, that your cultural background's perfect, you're perfect. And I felt in having people accept themselves and to accept banality, uh, and I was, I was responding and, um, inspired by things like Newport ads, where people would be balancing watermelons on their head and playing a trombone at the same time, and all of the type of advertising, gift shops at airports, all the cats on clothes lines and babies in buckets, and all of these things that we, we like, we respond to, we are, we're captivated by it, that it, that's okay. It's, it, it, and, but I felt that to do that, I also needed to have some spiritual figures there that would let people open up uh, and accept themselves. And, uh, and so Michael Jackson was there as a Christ-like figure. Uh, it's like the Pieta. It's the same type of Renaissance configuration of a triangular uh, sculpture. And so that uh, people would be able to go along with this. Uh, you mentioned about the Christ-like thing. I enjoyed uh, Michael's feelings. You know, when Michael just would kind of go, uh, uh, or, you know, these little noises. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's feeling. I mean, that is feeling. And uh, I'm there. Okay. You know, I'm, 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 yeah. feelings become ideas, and to celebrate sensations. And uh, so I was captivated by him uh, as an artist. Uh, yeah. Well, it changed a lot of views about pop art that that a lot of the contemporary art that you're working on had immense depth. It wasn't uh, decoration. It was um, serious intellectual thought. A certain number of critics would, uh, as in any era, would be uh, negative as to the uh, not understanding it. And then there were others that thought it was the greatest uh, innovation and movement forward in art. When you read those that were uh, mean, did it annoy you, or did you not read them? I read every negative thing ever written about me. My wife would go under the pillow and say, why are you reading it? I couldn't help myself. Were you reading it, or were you saying, they don't get it? Those that were critical, which were not that many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not naive of, uh, of you know, what's written about me or the perception of, of what it is. But I do think that uh, I'm interested. I believe in what I am trying to do. I want to be a better human being. I want to be a better uh, person. I want to be a better husband, a better parent. I want to be a better artist. And uh, you know, that's my life experience. I want to make an art. I want to try to reach a highest level of kind of transcendence I can as a human being uh, through my work, and I'd like to try to share that with others. I know it can be done. Uh, I think that, uh, I think Cy Twombly, in his late work, reached a very extreme level of consciousness. I think the work's divine. It's like from the other side. I think Picasso continued to become, reached a really high level of transcendence. And to be able to do that and to share that with others. I mean, you want to do it for yourself because uh, you want to do it for your family and you want to do it uh, for others. You talk about early on 
working with ready-made, things that were already made that you added artistic creation to, and then you moved on to handmade. Is there a big difference between those two? Um, or is it an evolution? It, it kind of started, I have a little scar here, uh, right here on my knuckle. And uh, when I was in college, during the summer I had to come home and I worked in a, a place that built uh, uh, wenches. And my hand slipped and I, it hit something here. And uh, you know, the doctor uh, cleaned it up. I said, there's a little mark there, but oh, that's, that's gonna be all right, kid. And I said, but it's gonna be okay. He said, oh, maybe you'll get arthritis when you're older. And uh, so, but I always would think about artists like Matisse or whatever, and you know, if I wanted to be free of my body. I didn't have to, I wouldn't worry whether I have arthritis or don't, I don't have arthritis. But uh, I didn't want to worry about my body. And so I was really intrigued by conceptualism and by Duchamp and by ideas. And at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's all about ideas and using the body. And if that lets you transcend to a higher level, that's fantastic. If it's by uh, using your mind, the biology of your mind, if that gets you to a higher level, that's great. You know? Okay, so then you did the whole world of your art in heaven where you found a artist in Italy who was, later became your wife, who was beautiful and, and had her own uh, popularity. And you then put yourself in art with her. And you then did art that was very erotic with you and she in it. And it was in the era of Mablethorpe. And it was quite, uh, created quite a stir in the press. And it was quite amazing work. And that was a kind of a change, because you were now putting yourself in your own art. And you were putting yourself in rather uh, risque positions. What drove you to that, and what drove you out of it, and, uh, and drove you to get married to your, your muse, and that whole section of your life, which is extremely interesting, and not like what was happening before. Not exactly what was like having after, either. You know, I used, I used myself. I made a piece called The New Jeff Coons for the new, which was a picture of me with my crayons when I was five. And because uh, the new was very much about not, per, uh, not participating, that uh, you know, objects, uh, when they're new, they're able just to display their integrity of birth. But for an individual, you know, we have to participate to uh, develop integrity. And it's kind of these different confrontations. Who's really better prepared for the eternal and uh, the strengths and uh, minuses? Uh, but uh, so as the individuals, like I had my most integrity then without participating. But it really kind of works differently. Uh, but when I made my uh, banality work, I was very much communicating to people about self-acceptance. But I realized that what gives people one of the, uh, and I did a piece like the Pink Panther or Woman in the Tub, that and you, they were porcelain pieces. And that was about removing guilt and shame because a lot of people learn about their own bodies in the bathroom when they're younger, as far as like masturbating. And they carry guilt and shame from that. So I was really on all different levels of psychology trying to remove guilt and shame. So with uh, Made in Heaven, I wanted to go more directly to the body. And I always loved Boucher's work and Froganard and uh, you know, Baroque artists, Courbet's origin of the world. And uh, so uh, my uh, ex-wife had a, an ability to really not have any guilt and shame about her body. You know? And so one of my favorite paintings from that whole group of work is called Ilona's Asshole. And, uh, and, and in that, it's, it, it's, a, it's a penetration that's taking place. But for me, it's the pimples on the ass and the confidence to just show your rear end with those pimples. And uh, uh, that's self-acceptance, you know. Uh, and, uh, so that was very much the dialogue. It was about every man and every woman and about biology. And it's the eternal. We have different realms of the eternal. We have biology, where life leapfrogs. And then we have Platonism. We have the realm of idea and the eternal through idea. And I was trying to you know, uh, have a dialogue about the eternal. 
And when you then, you had one child with her and then you have six other children, when those, any of those paintings would come up? I have a total of eight children, so I had one child with Emo and I have seven others. Seven others. Okay, I have only a few. But we have a Picasso. I'm not bragging about having a Picasso. We have another Picasso whose genitalia is showing. And my children were like, when they were young, you have to take that out of the dining room. It's the most embarrassing thing. I can't bring my friends in. Uh, they just wanted me to go away with the Picasso forever. Yeah. Did your children ever have a reaction to that series? And then when that series was over, you did a very comfortable series with, the, with a puppy. I and mean, you went completely the other way. So did your children prefer the other way? Or were they OK with well, them? You know, my, uh, yeah, my, uh, my children didn't respond. They, most of them weren't even around then. My one daughter uh, uh, was around, but uh, I didn't see her at that point. But uh, the kids, when they did, were around that work later on, after it was made, they would act like they didn't even see it. They would walk past one of these paintings and not Just even Just dead doing his another, thing. Uh, not even uh, kind of say uh, anything about it. Uh, and I, I don't live with my own work. Uh, I always want my family to think of me as dad. So we live with other artists' work. And uh, this way, they're completely free to have their own lives within the art. Yeah, but your studio is. <laughs> they I mean, the studio see? compared to, and we don't have time to go into that, but. You know, the, the Warhol studio was weird and drug-related and whatever, and your studio was like antiseptic with all this great art there and different versions of it. Uh, some art that, like, like uh, uh, Plato that you've been working on for 20 years. Uh, this is my last question, then I'm gonna open it up for questions because I, I wanted to ask it earlier, now I'm running out of time and I'm gonna ask it before I open it up. So you're the one of the few artists that today that will actually go to somebody and say, I want to do something. I have an idea. And are you interested? And they'll say, yes, of course, now. They may not have 25 years ago. Yes. And you'll say, OK, well, it's expensive to make. Forget me. Is it just to construct it? So you have to pay me something now. And you'll get it in five or six years or three years. And you've done that so successfully now some of these great works. Is that a new way of artists dealing with clients or galleries that you're actually somewhat working with a patron, but they know in advance what you're thinking, but it may not, something else may come in the way and it just sits in, you know, there for a while? Is that, or has that just happened or by chance? It, it happened over a period of time. I, I'm Ileana Sana Ben was my uh, home dealer uh, till Ileana passed away. And Ileana, uh, you know, after I uh, started to have uh, some success, she started to, uh, you know, uh, sponsor my work, and Ileana would just let me make anything I wanted. Uh, uh, but then at a certain point, you know, uh, when Ileana uh, wasn't there, I had to find other ways to be able to make the work. And it's really just to do pre-sales and to show people the work, and then if they, uh, think that they would enjoy it, that they acquire the piece, and then they just uh, pay for the production of that uh, piece going through. Uh, because of uh, the material of some of these uh, uh, pieces, you know, they can be uh, expensive to make. And uh, uh, it's a shame, but that's just kind of the reality of some of those works. Paintings or things like that that don't have the same type of demands uh, or sculptures like plasters or different works that don't have the same economic uh, demands of some of the stainless steel pieces I just make. And so what is, and I deal with this in my company, or Disney, or whatever I'm doing all the time, the difference between excellence and perfection. Yeah. Are you trying to achieve excellence, or are you demanding perfection? You know, uh, the, the part about me being a perfectionist, I really think is a myth. Uh, a lot of people, they all, everybody says I'm a perfectionist, and I, I do, I care very, very much. But I know the difference, like perfectionism, uh, it's like fetishism, and it's a dog chasing its tail. But I feel a moral obligation uh, to the viewer, uh, to the collector, and I try to make something the best I can, because what I really care about is them. 
And we don't really care about objects. Objects are just objects. But uh, so it's to, uh, to communicate, to maintain that abstraction through the artwork for as long as possible and to never let them feel let down. You know, if you pick this up and you notice, well, they didn't finish the bottom of this. Who, the, who feels you know, let down is the viewer. It's not, this object doesn't care whether the bottom's finished or not finished, but uh, the viewer feels like the attention wasn't given to them. So I would call that a perfectionist. <laughs> and the other person like that is Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, was, and I'm not, because when you ran a company as big as mine, if you went for perfection every time, and not, you go for excellence, but if you went for perfection every time, you would probably go under. Steve Jobs, and I used to talk to him about this all the time, say you have to paint the opposite side of the fence. And I would say if you go through a dark ride at Disney, nobody looks around and looks at the animatronic characters because they're looking forward. So excellence is doing the front of the thing, not the back. And we had many dinners trying to discuss the difference between perfection and excellence. And when you're doing art like you're doing, I think you can do perfection in my terms of perfection. Obviously, the dog chasing the tail is a very... But I take it as far as I can, and then there's a certain point where I know, okay, it's, I can pretty, say it's finished. It's pretty good. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, we're starting right here. Uh, please ask a question. Don't make a long statement. <laughs> Uh. Hi, Dana Montenegro. I, I want to ask you about, uh, you talk about uh, uh, the, both the artist and, and, the, and the viewer kind of own a piece of art. But take, for example, uh, Wall Street. The artist of the Raging Bull is very upset uh, that the context of art has been changed because of the defiant little girl. Uh, does the artist have a right uh, to set the context of art once it's put in public in the way that your art uh, in Paris might go and someone may try to reinterpret the context of it later. You know, the only thing you can do is within your lifetime, uh, you know, try to the best of your ability to be at the service of your work and to present the contextualization for the reasons that you did something. But eventually it's out of your control. It may go out of your control within your lifetime or if it's still around after your life, for sure you lose control at some point. But I, 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 as a young artist, I always wanted to uh, try to speak about what my intentions of my work were and would not leave it up to just to a criti uh, for a critic to interpret. Right here in the plan. Uh, one of the things I love about your work and your process is how focused on perfection you are such that you'll go to the ends of the earth to make things perfect. Have you ever abandoned anything because you thought it was impossible to get to the state you wanted it to? If so, why? I guess uh, they would be the ideas that are always in the back of my mind that, you know, that I'm working on. But I really have to pre-edit my work in advance because of all the processes and the time that it takes to make something, the attention. So usually what I'm thinking about today and ready to act on, I've been thinking about for at least two years, that it's been resonating, uh, sometimes much longer, but at least two years. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're, by the time that I've committed to make something, I know that I can realize it. There's only, and I don't want to name works, but there's really like only one piece that I feel sometimes maybe, maybe wasn't at, uh, the best that it could have been. Down here. Oh. Pink. My wife and I just wandered through Christie's and saw your magnificent washing machines, which sold for a huge amount of money. Did that make you want to go out and buy some washing machines? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in all seriousness, how would that make you feel? I mean, you've talked a lot about feelings and so on. What, what is that causing you? You know, I was really excited. The first time I showed my vacuum cleaners in a, in a show in a museum was on 14th Street in, uh, uh, in Manhattan at the new museum. And they had a window. So I had a little window, and I put uh, three different vacuum cleaners in there. 
And uh, the guards at the museum got so upset because people were coming in all day long wanting to buy vacuum cleaners. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I had a sign there that said the new, and there are these vacuum cleaners there. And I was excited about that. But you know, uh, you know, of course, I, I've wanted my whole life to have a platform for my work. And I've wanted to participate and to be in dialogue with other artists and to perform to the best of my abilities. So if something uh, is doing well and is supportive to the platform, you know, that's great. But uh, you know, my interest uh, is the reward from the participation, just being in the dialogue. So right here. And then, over, and then over here, next. Um, <clears throat> I apologize if this question might uh, uh, be provocative, but um, the excitement of contemporary art really is the fact that to a large degree it represents a particular social political context, at least to me. And that's why I'm so excited about uh, the contemporary art. I'd love to hear in your own words what is it that inspires you in a social economic context as to inspire you to do what you do? Uh, I don't know if I think about it as far as a social economic context. I mean, I realize how uh, wonderful uh, lives that a lot of us that are here, that I'm able to, uh, to live and that we live. But I think that people come across art you know, all the time. I mean, kids can go to a movie and, uh, you know, they could see maybe the Suicide Squad and uh, come across one of those figures like Harlequin in that and, and kind of wow. And, uh, you know, uh, art gives you uh, an essence about becoming and uh, lets you be able to take your interests and take them further. I don't know if that really has that divide. My work has tried to tell people to embrace the things that they respond to. And if you're coming from a different uh, social level, a different economic level, you're still coming into contact with things. And there's still things that give you pleasure and joy and that you should embrace those things. I mean, whatever somebody likes, you, you follow your interests and that's the only thing you have to follow. And if you do follow your interests, you know, it will take you to kind of a more universal vocabulary and connect you and let you uh, become transcend. So I think that art, in a way, uh, is, is free from that. How it operates is free from the economic political thing. There could be different stratospheres and things could get fluffy or whatever. But the way art functions, I think it functions free of that. I think right here there was Hello, Mr. Coons. Thank you so much for your talk today. Um, I'm also an artist, and I'm curious to know a little bit about your your practice or your process. So once you have solidified your idea and you have um, secured the funding for that, could you talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts about how you go about um, creating that in your studio? And do you hire young artists to help you? Um, you know, where do you order your materials? All those types of things. Okay, I'm going to start just a little prior, and because I find it even more interesting is where does the idea come from? Where do you get ideas? Because uh, to make something, you make something. But for me, uh, I remember after having my banality show, a journalist coming up to me, and you know, I just had this huge success. It was like Ileana Sonneben told me it was the biggest show since Lichtenstein's show in '63. And a journalist said, oh, aren't you afraid it's going to leave you, that uh, art is going to leave you? And I thought, wow, what a strange thing to ask a young person that just uh, has uh, had this success. But it made me start to think, well, what is it that you do? You know, what do I do uh, to create works? How do I come in contact with these things? And I, I realized the only thing that any of us can do is follow our interests. And there, there's nothing else. I mean, I can't follow somebody else's interests. And, but uh, so you have your interests. And you know, what can be more pleasurable and more fun and joyful than following your interests? So uh, follow your interests. But then the next level is to focus on those interests. 
And if you follow your interests and you focus on those interests, you'll realize that everything you're interested in is all around you in its abundance. And it will take you and it will lead you and funnel you through different forms of vocabulary. If you continue to uh, focus on, uh, follow your interests, focus on your interests, to this metaphysical place where it connects you with a universal vocabulary. And time and space bend there, and that's where art is. Uh, and it never fails. It never fails. And that's the only thing that any of us can do in our lives, whatever area we're interested in. We're running out of time, or we're out of time. Let me just say that, as a follow-up to that one question, just to end, that a lot of people have ideas in my business and in the art world. And it's one thing to have an idea, and it's another thing to execute the idea and actually get it done. And with Jeff Koons, not only are the ideas interesting and deep and relevant, but what a master of organization, just plain organization, to get that idea finished. To get a, you know, everybody has an idea for a play, to get a play written and then get it produced and it to be Hamilton. That's what this man does every year, 15 times a year in, or more in, in sculpture and paintings. It's not only the idea, it's actually the execution and that dog chasing his tail, which I think you do a lot of to end up with stuff that's so good. Thank you, Jeff Koons, for being here.